Ladies and gents, hello, good evening, and welcome to the April meeting of the New Sheridan Club. Talk doesn't seem to be here, so I'll. Um... He did send a message. He's uh, uh, a bit of unseasonable and uh, difficult to find. Of a fight in like nature. Very nice. Um, not too many announcements to make. Uh, as you should all know by now, uh, we're trying to do something a bit different with the magazine. Uh, people keep speaking to me and saying, oh, it's the end of, the, of resigning. That's not really the point that I was trying to get at. If anyone wants to take over doing it as it is now or in some other way, that's great. Now, I actually think it would be very healthy for the club for the magazine to be run by someone else or indeed by a committee of people. But people will have to organise that. Uh, we're getting there. Um, I think that the current idea is to do a monthly email just covering the basics. Uh, resign will then maybe become something that comes out three or four times a year, I'd like a sort of proceedings of the new Sheridan Club. Uh, Tim Eyre might be willing to do the typesetting and stuff like that, which is, is <coughs> finding someone to do that is quite useful because surprisingly few people seem to be familiar with uh, DTP software. I would have seen more of them, but maybe not. Um, and if we can get together a committee of people who maybe individually would handle one strand. You know, if there's one person who wants to keep their finger on the pulse of events, someone else who wants to organise the Brogues Gallery, which turned out to be more popular than I expected from the poll. Uh, if anyone hasn't done that poll, I know there's a bit of a palaver about it. But the Google version works quite well, and it, it gives me all sorts of pie charts I can look at and stuff like that. So it would be handy, those of you who, if you, could be, if you can bear it, those of you who filled in the early version, then there can only be 10 of you at the most, <laughs> or who did it by email, if you wouldn't mind just filling in the Google one, uh, that makes it much easier for us to collate information about that. Um, in terms of events, the uh, punting's coming up later this month. Um, those of you who don't know, it's a tradition to go punting in Oxford um, round about St George's Day, and that's happening. Uh, Candlewack Club's happening in this week. Uh, you should all have had an email We've got plenty of spare capacity on Friday, so if anyone from the club fancies uh, complimentary tickets, you're very welcome to. Just come along, look decorative, fill the place up, spend some money at the bar. <laughs> mm. um, have I missed anything? Is there anything else important that's happening this month? I think that's about it. La I think later on in May, is it the, the <coughs> Children's Beach Weekend? Is it in May? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's some talk. There's some talk about a. Yeah, I mean, that was the punting, I mentioned that. And there's the summer house. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I will do. But, but just, so I just have a little, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Thank you for everyone that's... that's can we come up here? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I can see you at home. I, 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 I can see you at home. Okay, I'm live. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and good evening to your home. Um, yeah, hello. Um, so the summer house, um, for those who are interested, I, I, I put something out speculatively, um, if anyone would like to come along, because it, uh, it's been a roaring success in the past. And really, the essence is behind it is I wanted to get a bunch of people who were committed. Uh, I'll set up their own, uh, a separate forum to it. They'll be obviously they'll be connected to, to to what you already know. Um, the the point here is for being what, why such a long lead in time? I'm, I'm trying to do a purse for all uh, and accommodate all. I, I really want people to come along, and if it means contributing just a little bit of funds every week, I'd rather have people in rather than I'm able to budget for it. Uh, and then set aside and have a really nice time where menus are properly considered, games and activities are properly considered, accommodation is really nicely considered, and everybody can relax. And they are not sitting there going, ah, what's going on? You know, I don't know. The one thing I don't want to have happen uh, is that, so it's it, where it's all just a sudden thing, including, I might add, transit. Yes, I am thinking that far ahead. I want to do a really nice show of it all. So I'd like to see a situation where I can actually pick people up. We can go out somewhere, somewhere nice and it'd be in the long summer evenings. Kids, very welcome to come of course, because obviously with the, with the new Sheridan Club's children's beach parties, that's, that's great. So getting a whole bunch of people together. So please express your interest to me. There will be a separate forum and a separate email and I'll set it all up for you. I, I promise I won't just go off to the Bahamas with the funds. <laughs> I can that's not the case. It will all be properly. It will all be properly. I can assure you, it will all be properly accounted for. It will all be. And Minna uh, has kindly agreed to help me do it because 
it, it, it's, it is not a Bullingdon club. I can emphasise that, you know, where we're just turning into a jolly. But I want everyone to have a nice time and relax. It is a holiday. It is a holiday. You over there, Grey, go, young man. <laughs> Heard you. Thank you very much, Clay. Right, right. Eagle Eye may have noticed that while that was going on, the computer crashed. <laughs> I'm just uh, restarting the presentation. Excellent timing. <laughs> it seems to do that every month, but I'm not quite sure what point it does. Shazza, Shazza, Shazza. You're not invited straight away. Oh, right. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure they've got a mind of their own computers. Discrimination. Yes. 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 It's going to do a full reboot. <laughs> yeah, I did. We had a restart. It's a certain point in the entire screen just turns into white noise. Uh, <laughs> should come back in half an hour. It's just starting up now, right? Uh, How are you? I'm oh, okay, thanks. I've still got your badge. Oh, I see. So it's the long badge. Right. Uh, I saw a little key last time I met. Okay, here we go. Quiet down, everybody, please. Thank you. In the cheap seats. Yes. In the gallery. Are we ready to go? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're rolling. Okay. Yeah, boom. I'll begin. Thanks. Ali just said this is riveting. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Okay. Thank you, Clayton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Clayton reminded me, this is my third talk on Sir Henry Chip's channel, and I have been overwhelmed with the uh, messages from members of the new Sheridan Club. But despite all that, I have decided to go ahead with the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Before I begin, I, will, I would like to say something about the painting of uh, Chips, and that's his son Paul. He commissioned this. It was painted by the artist James Gunn in 1938 and is uh, an oil on canvas. Now, um, for those of you, I will give a very brief resume of Chips Chan. He was a, a Conservative MP in the, th in the 30s. He was American by birth, but he was uh, an Anglophile. Uh, he mixed in higher society, he married uh, a member of the Guinness family. He, he had his own wealth anyway from his family, but he was immensely wealthy after he married um, the daughter of, the, of Earl Ivy. And his, and, um, so he, li he lived in Belgrade Square and he, had, I was like, you know, he, he basically knew anyone and everyone and he was a... Um, he was a, a what they call a PPS, which is what they call a bag carrier. But he he was quite important in, in terms of the government in that people confided in him because he would sound he could sound out everybody because he knew everybody. And he was PPS to uh, a person called Rand Butler, who was uh, in the Foreign Office. Anyway, I just a few words about this painting. Uh, Channing doted on his son Paul. That's Paul there who would succeed him as MP for South End West in 1959, aged as 23. Uh, he would better his father by becoming a Minister of State, although he was somewhat cruelly dubbed the Minister for Disasters. You may remember in the late 1980s, following the King's Cross fire, the Clapham Junction rail crash and the Lockerbie disaster on his watch as Transport Secretary. Uh, and he also better his father by becoming a peer. Um, Ch Chipstown was knighted, but he never quite made it to be a peer, though he would have liked to have been. And on his retirement from Parliament in 1997, uh, he became Baron Kelvin. Now, the second volume of the Unexpurgated Diaries of Henry Chipstown, 19, um, covers a period of just under five years, five of the most dramatic and tumultuous years in British history. And for the sake of um, making this talk manageable, I've actually 
running from 1938 to the beginning of World War II because we simply wouldn't have time to cover everything. Else. So um, I've, I've tried to keep it as <coughs> concise as I possibly could. Now, the diaries opened October 38, just as Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister of the National Government, that had ruled since 1931, has returned from Munich and his meeting with Hitler, at which the uh, Sudetenland was uh, carved out of Czechoslovakia and given to the Nazi Reich on a plate. Uh, you may remember the famous, you've probably seen the film, where Chamberlain arrived at the Munich airport waving the piece of paper that he said was signed by her Hitler. I mean, Hitler signed it, but he didn't know what he was signing. But it was meant to be a peace agreement. Anyway, Channon was an appeaser and a deeply loyal devotee of Chamberlain and is relieved and delighted that, um, that Chamberlain has come back with this piece of paper. Monday, 3rd of October, fired Belgrave Square. This is his home in London. Honor and I motored up and I rushed to the Foreign Office the, s the storm breaks over the government for having preserved peace. The big debate debat began. I could scarcely control my rage against the wicked insurgents who from ambition, stupidity and hatred of Chamberlain would upset the government. They are led by Winston Churchill, that, that bullfrog, <laughs> slave of prejudice, and of course that ass, Anthony Eden, that is Anthony Eden, who uh, actually resigned as Foreign Secretary over... Italy, which is still... He's basically one of the... With Churchill, they were the um, members of the, of, of the Conservative Party who uh, disliked Chamberlain and they thought he was an appeaser and they were concerned that we would have to go to war with Germany at some stage. War mongers. War, yes, you could war them. Who is one of the most unaware, uninformed people I've ever known. This is Eden. At 3.13 p.m. The, the PM, 3.13, the PM rose. He was quietly magnificent. That's him there. Um, I looked up at Mrs. Chamberlain in the Speaker's Gallery where she has sat for four long days. So it was a long uh, debate in Parliament. The PM even has time to make a gay reference to Winston Churchill with whom he has crossed swords early in the day when he called his utterings unworthy of him and Winston was howled down. Old Winston looked like an angry Buddha. The figures for the next division, which was the main question, were 366 for us and 144 for war. I had a banquet in South End, but I could not concentrate on preparing the speech, and so went, as it were, empty-handed. The result was one of the best speeches I have ever made. It was a, fa a fascinating defence of the PM, and I was greeted with thunderous applause. I was self confident and a little drunk. One of my ex-opponents in Southend, a puce-faced man, Victor Tattersall, who so resembles Ribbentrop, the German foreign secretary, asked me if I was on the square and want, wanted, to, wanted to, me to join the lodge. I am rather intrigued by the idea. I should enjoy the masoch masochistic in, in initiation ceremonies, I think. Wednesday, 26th of October. A long confidential talk with Alderman Tweedy Smith, the head of the Liberals, confirm my impression that the man is an opinionated ass. Light metal, no danger to us, and per but personally well disposed towards me. He believes in birching boys. A well-tanned bottom, he said, is often the foundation of a good career. <laughs> Friday the 28th of October, went up to London, lunched at the Belgian Embassy to meet the Crown Princess of Italy. Uh, sorry, that's the Crown Princess of Italy. Um... She is like honour, fair, good-looking, rather grandiose in manner, hates society and loves mountaineering. Of course, she is unhappily married. She has been at school at Brentwood, four miles from here. She is a restless, underserved woman sexually. Lunch was too drawn out. Sunday the 3rd of October, via Vaughan at Calverton. Prince Fitzy, that's Prince Fitzy, he's the... Um, son of the um, Kaiser who was um, exiled to Holland. And this is um, Prince Fritzi of Prussia came here for the day. He's first back from Germany via Dawn. That's where uh, the Kaiser was residing, where he stayed with the Kaiser. 
Fritz thinks the Nazi leaders will eventually devour one another and then there will be a coup d'etat by the army. We should like to see him in emperor. I've always said so. Wednesday, 2nd November. In, as the division was appro approached, I found myself alone on the second bench. Suddenly a hand was placed on my shoulder and looking up I saw that my friend was Anthony Eden. Then he murmured, come out for a moment. And I followed him into the eye lobby and we went into the laboratory and peed together. He was charm itself. He has not seen much of me all these years. He had been so, so busy. Saturday the 18th of November. That gawky, good-tongued, absurd hoyden via the tree has followed her husband to the grave. She was young, immense, funny and kindly. I've never liked trees of any description. And Lord Beecham... That's Lord Beecham. And Lord Beecham died in New York, age only 66. What a turbulent life. Rank, riches, arrogance, intelligence, achievement, high office, seven children, the God's gifts at his feet, and he squandered them all for the most sterile of vices, footmen. After a night, Sunday the 27th of November, Calvin, after a night of wet dreams, really at my age it's surprising but always reassuring, I woke weak, Paul, his son, climbed into my bed. He is always asking questions about spanking. Does he want one? <laughs> Wednesday, 14th December, early a.m. Very foolish that I stayed at the Wallace's party last night until 4 a.m. and drank too much champagne, as indeed did everybody else. At the foreign press bank, but Chamberlain made a very great speech in which he gently castigated the German press. The German ambassador and the German press correspondents stayed away, thus creating a bad impression. They are too tactless always. A message came from the that's a du from the Duchess of Kent. That's the Duchess of Kent. A message came from the they actually the Kent sleeping next door to um, uh, Chan and his wife at number three Belgrave Square. A message came this morning from the, du the, the Duchess of Kent wanted me to take her to the theatre tonight, but I couldn't, as I must attend a law society banquet in South End, and I do not dare chuck so near an election. Sunday, 18th December, Leeds Castle. Leeds all day, morning in bed, conversations with Geoffrey Lloyd. That's Geoffrey Lloyd, MP. Who, as usual, has a Brazilian lady in tow. He can never resist the darkly romantic Dago type. He finds them dashing. But Kay Norton tells me that he doesn't go to bed with them or anyone else. That he is, in fact, a virgin. I have my doubts. Friday, 23rd December, a nervous, irritable day, irritable day. Everything went wrong, stupid servants. At length, Honor went to Elvedon. That's the family, Guinness home. She's far from well and looks worn out after three weeks holiday skiing. I fear there is something organically wrong with her. Sunday, 25th December, I went with the family and the Elvedons to church. On a stay behind in a bad temper. She's always surly, always sulky and surly now. Breakfast was a function, a feature. Even Honor came down and there was a big present distribution. I gave Honor three Fab Fabergé cigarette cases and had them marked and arranged. She gave me a pair of emerald cufflinks, which I am to return and have made into ruby ones, which I want. Lady Ivy gave me a watch which had belonged to the Sultan. More food, crackers and fun. Appalling weather, we are snowed up. Wednesday, 28th December, Elvedon. We came back here for the wedding celebration. Alan Nevix Boyd and... <coughs> That's Alan Nevix Boyd. He's a fellow MP and a friend of Channon. And he, uh, Channon is setting up to marry uh, Patsy Ivy, who's... Sorry, Patsy Guinness... Uh, who's a sister of honour. Uh, so, once again, very wealthy. Uh, we came back here for the wedding celebration, Annette Lennox Boyd and Patsy Guinness. We are 37 to dine. Mrs Lennox Boyd, the domineering mother, would lo looks like a crumpet, and the eldest son, George, who is a rotter and a poser, I think are staying in the house. Then there are Freya Stark, who is the lady Hester Stanhope of the age, and wears bizarre clothes. Lord and Lady Brockett, overdressed and young and fresh. Lady Halifax, Harold Balfour and many more. 
Dinner was fantastic. Then we all fled, in, filed into the library to see the presents. They're an impressive lot, except those given by the constituents. And so at last to bed. The evening went with a swing. I felt an emotion of power. I had brought it about. I had brought Alan into our lives and encouraged him to marry Patsy. May I never regret it. Thursday, 29th December. The great wedding day began. I ordered two bottles of champagne. The bridegroom, Harold, Jim, Donald and I, all drunk. An early lunch at 12 o'clock. And then afterwards, MPs and others began to arrive in spite of the Russian weather. I looked after the MPs. We all drank more champagne from the loving cup. Alan and Patsy left in a, in a rain of rice and confetti and rose petals for Kelvedon, where I had made elaborate arrangements for the bridal pair. Kelvedon is the uh, Channing country home in Essex, just outside of Brentwood. That's it there. We all, Sunday 31st term with Kelvin, we all assembled here. The honeymooners were here, both looking well. They occupy the, the Empire suite. After a time, Alan went back to his bed. I deplore such tactics. The bu double bed is the secret of marriage, and all my troubles began from the day that I deserted him. 1939, Sunday the 8th of January. Honor and I motored to Stansted Hall, Hampstead, to lunch with the butlers. Rudd Butler, probably remember him, he, he famous for education system, actually reformed the education system after the war, but at the time in, uh, um, he was in, working in the foreign office, and that's his wife. On and I motored stands at all house, said to lunch with the Butlers, he is so pleased at being a privy councillor, which he said he owed largely to me. She was game pleasant and I'm glad to relate on better terms with Honour, who detests her appalling food in a dreadful house. Friday, 26th of January. Esmond, Esmond Harmsworth, handsome. That's Esmond Harmsworth, um, owner of the Daily Mail. Esmond Harmsworth, handsome, simple, a touch dull, but charming. A little deft, arrived here for the weekend, bringing his lady love, Anne O'Neill. The charming Chartres sisters are practically tarts, but distinguished ones. Monday, 23rd of January. At the Foreign Office, most of the day, and Rab re received a deputation of angry ladies who he feared at one moment would clock him. They are the pro-red fanatics, Violet Bonham Carter and Miss Sylvia Pankhurst, a desperate left-wing individual, angry, short-handed and lesbian. Jenny Lee and Rosamond Lehman, Sunday, 28th of January, Harold Balfour and Rob Bernays. That's Harold Balfour and that's Rob Bernays, both Conservative MPs. Harold Balfour and Rob Bernays arrived to study, ministers both, but not friends. Bernays is very vicious sexually, I have discovered. <laughs> that's Rob Bernays. Uh, Friday, 3rd of February, I arrived at number three Belgo Square, that's the Duke of um, Kent's residence, for dinner and found a most illustrious sorted party of 14 people, social waves and strays, evidently collected by the Duke to amuse himself during the Duchess's absence. The most surprising guest and the most de delighted to be there was Mr Roots, the motorman magnet. Can't find him. <laughs> William Roots. Probably don't remember Roots. They, um, the Roots group. The Roots group. Um, they went. They went. They went. They were bought out by Chrysler in the seventies, uh, but they were very big manufacturer. Riggs was, um, you know, almost mm. as big as um, um, Lord and um, Austin and Morris. They, they, anyway, that's it. Yeah, I know it's in Canada, but that's clothing. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, 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 well. Yes, with Mr. Roots, the motor magnet millionaire. Bad food, but glorious china for the usual biblos. I drove to the House of Commons, picked up Ronnie Cartland. Where's Ronnie Cartland? There's someone. Damn. No, 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 no,
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pierced it, he pierced it, oh dear. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rob's gone. Thank you. I drove the House of Commons, picked up Ronnie Carland, and we went shopping. He is an amiable gossip, and I gave him a second rate source boat. Bed at 6 30, and I had hoped to sleep for 12 hours or more. There have been serious explosions, bombs found in the underground. A reign of terror has come on for weeks now. It is alleged to be the work of Irish extremists. Sunday the 12th of February. I have been ill since last Monday with flu. High temperatures and depression. Today I got up. Alan and Patsy, Harold and Rob Bernays all came to see me. Ola telephoned me to say that she had gone to Kitzbühel. So you can see his marriage is not exactly going very well. Friday, 24th of February. What a flop, Anthony Eden. For six months now, not a, not a day passed that I did not drop poison into ministerial ears about the lies of the Eden influence. I'm not as able as Anthony, but I'm more resolute, subtler and cleverer. Sunday, 5th of March. My strength is really failing me. I am so tired sometimes, yet I must be attractive still. As never before have I had so much sexual success as during the past few weeks. I haven't the time to follow it up. Tuesday, 7th of March, my birthday. No presents except honours pictures of the House of Commons, the Hogarth one. Saturday, 11th of March, a rest, a Turkish bath, a visit to the American consulate to sign power attorneys, as I gather that there is an excellent chance of my American property achieving higher rentals. Monday, 13th of March, having finally adjusted my dinner party for 4.30pm, I went to the bath club for a turker. The Kents enjoyed themselves. They did not leave until 1.30, nor did anybody else. All the women, yes, even the government wives, were well dressed. But I insisted that the men wear black ties. The Jack Duke prefers it. There's no halfway house with royalty, really. It is either black ties or tails and decorations. The Duchess of Kent did not go to ladies. How does she manage? All royalties have amazing bladders. Wednesday, 5th of March, Hitler has entered Prague, apparently, and Czechoslovakia has ceased to exist. It's a great day for the socialists and the Edenites. The BM is discouraged, horrified. My poorly beloved little Neville, he looked born down upon today. Sunday, 19th of March, we went to Amptill House, where Luella went Westminster joined us. That's the weather of Westminster, Duchess of Westminster. Well, the Westminster joined us to lunch with an absurd old wardress, Sir Anthony Wake Winfield, who is an octogenarian, vulgarian, in love, although a widower with a family, with Alan. He was enchanting to entertain the Duchess. We sat through a pompous meal of eight courses. Tuesday, 21st of March, Sidney Herbert has died in the south of France. No loss to me, little to anybody else. He had been ill for years, self-indulgent, intolerant, a bore, common. He has too long. He was too long overrated and conceited. Wednesday, 22nd of March, the Ivy's to lunch, and I talked to my wife on the telephone. She is still in that mysteriously philandering at Brule. Wednesday, 22nd of March, tonight was the grand great gala at Covent Garden for the frogs. I wore my court dress. I'm only happy in velvet, really. And it scorted Luella Winston to Emeralds. Emerald is uh, Emerald Cunard, who's another um, wealthy socialite, the um, wife of um, Cunard of shipping fame. Where we all dined, I'd taken a box of £26, that's about uh, £1,865 a day, and invited Luella and the Lennox Boyd as my guests. There was appalling traffic trouble finding our cars. Literally hundreds of people wandered about on the coldest night of the week, looking and waiting for footmen. What the local people must have thought, I don't know, except that English crowds always like a grand show. Saturday, 14th of April, I drove to Calvin 
hung pictures, saw gardeners, the house looked pleasant, but disappointingly small. Sunday 2nd of April, we motored up to London like, everyone seems happy about our guarantee of Poland. I think it is madness. Monday 3rd of April, a long debate at the house. The debate was a star one. It was opened by Greenwood, who has behaved with dignity and helpfulness during the crisis. Like most drunks, he is really rather decent at heart. Tuesday, 4th of April. I am apprehensive about our new policy. We have made a pledge we cannot implement and will look both treacherous and ridiculous in the event of a German invasion of Poland. Quite right. This morning I wandered into the private secretary's room where I found Neville Henderson. It's Neville Henderson, a very dapper gentleman. He was the British ambassador in Berlin. Uh, well, I found Neville Henderson, debonair and elegant, sitting at a desk. He had a few words. We had a few words. Hitler, he, he thinks, is partly mad. Later, I was wakened by an urgent telephone message that Alan was en route to see me. He'd arrived as stalked as he sat on my bed. He babbled an incredible story, which sounded too dramatic and unlikely to be true. It seems that last Wednesday, his two brothers, George and Donald, arrived in the evening from Cologne at Stuttgart. Donald, the mad attractive one, had parted from his brother at the station saying he would join him at, the ho at their hotel. About midnight, George watched him go off with an with a ugly stormtrooper. About 10.30pm, George, having dined alone, was just getting into bed when the dreaded Gestapo arrived and arrested him. He was taken to prison, stripped in questions, and told that Donald had been arrested for spying and also for homosexuality. I realised at once that we faced a major scandal. King Ghazi of, of Iraq was killed by a motor car. He is unlucky with motoring since his chauffeur gave him the clap only recently. <laughs> Thursday, 6th of April. The consul in Frankfurt has reported that Donald hanged himself in his cell last night. I broke it to Alan as gently as I could. I'm sorry for Donald, but what a, self, but what a selfish action. Why not wait until the trial came up tomorrow, as he might have been acquitted? A certain homosexual baronet was recently allowed to hop bound in Germany after a similar charge. Or was he beaten to death by the angry Nazis? Good Friday, 7th of April. The Italians are occupying Albania. King Zod has fled, whilst Queen Geraldine, a semi-American semi-tart, and her two-day-old baby have fled to Greece. Friday, 11th of April. Conscription is coming before May the 1st. This is Harry Cruikshank, um, a, a, a Labour MP. Harry Cruikshank is now on the threshold of Cabinet. He's been an excellent Minister of Mines. He has no balls. They were cut off after the war, and Diana Cooper, serving as a nurse, was present at the operation. She told me so herself. I attended the brewery meeting and once again heard the doleful account of how our fortunes are dis diminishing. All breweries are doing badly. I felt antisocial tonight and continued to dine like a Labour MP in the tea room of a scrambled egg and tea. Thursday, 4th of May, I was dining with Dinah Cooper, that's Dinah Cooper, who was another leading socialite, at the Dorchester, where she has collected 60 chums in aid of a charity function. She is the past mistress of using other people, but she is so charming that one doesn't mind, although I resent not being repaid the £10 I'd lent her in Geneva. Now, I might not sing very much, but that's about £717 today. Saturday, 6th of May, I had a long talk with Bill Astor in my room. This is uh, Lady Astor, the Liberal MP. I had a long talk with Bill Astor in my room. He doesn't present my rudeness to his mother, Lady Astor, who was referred to yesterday in the debate as the member for Berlin. She is giving a ball tonight to which we were uninvited. I shall never cross her threshold again. She is loathed in the house now and it's by all parties. Wednesday, 10th of May, at 5 o'clock, I left in my Grand Green Rolls Royce for South End, where I picked up Honour at the Grand Hotel. She had been there, poor darling, since 3pm when she had escorted Lady Halifax to the Curzel. We dined with the Mayor at Porter's Green and, contrary to my explanations, I rather liked the Bishop of Chelsea, who was a solid lefty. 
Tuesday 13th May, I had an hour with our financial secretary, Captain Vashoyle, tried to get our bills down, the household accounts, etc., come to about a thousand per month. That's about 71, 72,000 today. And I can never succeed in reducing them substantially. Saturday, 3rd of June, this is Philip Sassoon. Philip Sassoon died today. He will be a loss to the London pageant. Has no one uh, infused so much colour and personality? He was sleek, clever, amiable, but treacherous and snobbish. He was a homosexual, but there was never any open scandal. His favourites were usually young pilots in the Air Force. He was under the Secretary of State for Air for 11 years. Tuesday, 6th of June, I was sitting in our room. A cable came announcing the death of Isabel Crow, and my thoughts were jolted back to long ago when she loved me. My affair with Isabel began quietly and continued from October 20, 1924 to February 1925, further meetings in Chicago at various hotels, even breakfast and quick flurried fornications after a dentist working husband departed for his office. Tuesday 13th of June, I slept 10 hours and was then received by and then pummeled by my sadistic Swedish masseur. I feel well. I sleep so badly in the country, particularly at Calden, where the air is so stimulating that everyone complains of insomnia. Back in Belgrave Square, I sleep marvellously. Saturday, 13th of June, an Essex day. On and I drove to the other Kelvedon, that's in uh, near Colchester in Essex, and lunched with the Boltons at Braxted Park. It's a lovely house, romantic in the midst of a fine park, in the midst of a fine park with fine trees. Bolton is an attractive man, but a touch fraudulent. She looks like a cook. Two dark genetic sons were present. Tuesday, 20th of June. Anna sat up last night until 3.30am at Stornham Way House, where she died with Max Beaver book. That's Max Beaver book, famous uh, newspaper magnet, uh, owned a Daily Express, which was a very um, uh, popular middle-ranking paper, much more popular than Daily Mail. And uh, he also became a minister in the um, wartime governments. Anna sat up last night till 3.30 at Stornoway House where she died in Max Beaver book, who was in back at mood. Rothermere was also there, and Kitty Brunlow. Max kept saying, if only Honor would divorce Chips and marry me. The old Sarlidius drank too much 1906 champagne and eventually removed his trousers. Thursday, 22nd of June. Tonight we had our great dinner party to celebrate Franco's victory. Do homage to the Queen Ana and plot the restra restoration of the Spanish throne. There followed the most appalling ten minutes of my life. Due to some hitch in domestic arrangements, the Blinis, the first course, was delayed. No one noticed for a moment or two, eased by lashings of champagne. Wednesday, 28th of June, dined at Laura Corrigan's. That was Laura Corrigan. She was a famous... Uh, American socialite in London, a gigantic party of over 150 covers. Laura changed her game tonight. There were no naked Japanese wrestlers, no gilded jugglers thrown into the air, no Apache dancers. The champagne was indifferent. I left about 2.30 a.m. <laughs> Thursday, 29th of June. When I got back to the house, I fetched Rab, with whom I'm becoming increasingly intimate, and I escorted him to the Foreign Affairs Committee, which he addressed for 40 minutes, exerting a calming influence. Friday, 30th of June. Dressed in a little Friday blue flannel number, I lunched with Emerald, where I found the Spanish and Bel Belgian ambassadors, Sir Robert and Lady Vanistart, Lady Lauren Londonderry, Laura Corrigan, Sir George Clark and Brendan Bracken, a distinguished party. I drove to Pyford, Prince Fritzy of Prussia following in a small car. Fritzy went to dine with the Sutherlands for their vast party. We all followed. All London was present. I was immediately led up to the Queen of Spain. That's the Queen of Spain. Um, who was in white and wearing many pearls. She was enraptured with our dinner party and said so a dozen times. Her face is a libid libidinous one and for a second I wondered whether she was flirtatious. She almost excited me. It would be fun to have an affair with a queen. Shall I pursue it? Her conversation is lecherous enough. 
Sunday, Saturday 30 line. There's been alarm, more alarming news about Danzig. Later a push of occupation, etc. Everyone is most gloomy. Monday 3rd July, the Kelmsley's ball, Kelmsley's ball at Shandos House was overcrowded. The luminous, ample, colourful Lady Kelmsley tried to combine two things. A great ball and a debutante's party. And in, in so doing, fouled in both. It was very hot. I thought of Peter Gates. That's not Peter Gates. Talking much yourselves. <laughs> That's Peter Peter Coates. This is, um, as you probably gathered, his wife Anna is gallivanting across Europe, skiing mostly and probably um, having affairs as well. And uh, Peter Coates was a, um, a member of the armed forces. I think he was an adjutant to. Um, uh, well, he was an adjutant to a general, I can't remember his name now, but anyway, he, he met Shannon and um, they became very close friends, in fact, uh, very intimate friends, you might say. I thought of Peter Coates, who I met for the first time at dinner. There I found the government, the government pipers, many Scottish, and many Scottish people. There was an, an aroma of mothballs. How badly dressed are the Scottish aristocracy? Saturday, 8th July, Patrick began in Hepburn as we made a whip. A stupid appointment which will offend and please no one. He's fundamentally stupid. I should have been better at it. Monday, 10th July, little Princess Cecile of Prussia is staying with me at Five Belgrave Square and she has bought a dark, engaging damsel, a Miss Cynthia Ellert. They lunched in and I uh, collected Master Coates, Tony Loughborough and a young Jack Kennedy. It's a young guy. It's actually a picture taken at the time, so that's, that's how he looked at that time. He was in his early 20s. Um, to amuse them. Hilarious little party, and later I took them all here to the house as they wanted to see the PM. Thursday, 13th of July, a very curt, cold, brief letter from Honour. I'm sad and apprehensive about her, but who can fare? I fear trouble, ultimately. I lunched with Lord Halifax... Lord Halifax, who, who was the Foreign Secretary. Um, I lunched with Lord Halifax at the Carton Hotel, a party to meet the Spanish journalists. I hate Spaniards. Friday, 14th of July, six years married today. I'm sorry that my marriage is not more of a success. Perhaps I'm to blame, but it has a most complicated, aloof, mysterious nature. A peaceful heavenly evening at Kelvin, which looks lovely. Peter Coates is most delightful, knowledgeable and gay. Today is my Wednesday night in July. Today is my poor, frustrated mother's birthday. She is 70, looks 100, and is lonely, sad, self-centred and miserable. I don't suppose I should ever see her again. I'd never cared for her at all since I was 12. Tuesday, 25th July. I woke well and refreshed. It's curious that PC, Peter Coates, Never tires me, but makes me happy and stimulates me. He is an attractive Piero, cosy and gay and well-informed. He reminds me of Coral. He is pink and, go and gold like an, as <laughs> an Assam cherub and companionable and centre and amazingly well-dressed. Wednesday, 26 July. To allow I am glorious health due to large doses of glucose, I tire easily and fall asleep in the afternoons either in the library at the house with the recently married Alfred Beat snoring at my side, or I go home and collapse. Thursday, 27th July. Today is the Mayor's Garden Party in South End, but I'd rather lost interest in the constituency, which is foolish with an, an election impending. Saturday, 29th July. I woke late, happy and refreshed. I sang in my bath and felt all day the cheeriness of contentment. 
Towards tea time, Emerald Kennard arrived like a whirlwind, and she was escorted by Thomas Beecham. That's Thomas Beecham, the famous uh, uh, conductor, who was in benign mood. She was captivating, talked to music society and Mrs. Vanderbilt. A most successful evening, but I drank too much champagne. Tuesday, 11th of August, a letter from Peter and many postcards and snapshots from Honor, who is adoring her curious, cold, isolated holiday halfway up heaven on the Jungfrau. Wednesday, 2nd of August, I attended the Guinness Directors meeting. It was a depressing meeting. I was reminded of Franz Howe's canvas. Gloomy old man, lacking vision and imagination. Of course, the profits are down again. Still, the reserves are so enormous about 10 million, which is 717 million today, and I was out of sympathy with the board's decision to cut the bonus from 29% to 26%. No, it wasn't that bad, really. Thursday, 23rd of August, lunch with Emerald, a small party. I left for the bath club where I slept for three hours. I'm shocked by my increased weight, 12 stone 7 pounds. Deplorable, so tonight I don't drink at all. Thursday, 8th of August, I woke at 6, got up and went for a long walk with Bundy, that's his dog. There were yokels working, cleaning debris, the Essex sun shone through the trees, the noise of chopping on of boughs draped over turf. It was like a grim fairy story. My child to lunch with us, atrocious weather and appalling complications with our ex-nanny, who is semi-insane as a result of having her festering uterus removed. Wednesday, 9th of August. Paul is very intelligent, alarmingly so. But like me, he hates the French and won't learn their lingo from Mademoiselle Laurent, the, the gay girl who is here for that purpose. Sunday, 13th of August. Intense heat again. Honor and I... That's, uh, that's Honor and that's Chips in the Garden. That's about... That is 1938, actually. Uh, intense heat again. Honor and I lay naked all day until tea time when Federer of the German Embassy arrived to stay. A pleasant fellow, he takes the most gloomy view of the in international situation, thinks there may be, well be war this actual summer. Saturday, 19th of August. Bas this is Basil Dufferin. Um... Basil Daffering arrived in a fiendish temper and with a red rose. He is surly, rude to his wife, silent and does not eat. He drinks, soaks in whiskey, port and gin all day and lays up kummel after dinner. Sunday 20th of August, Calverton is looking a dream of vernal lush beauty. We lazed all day, lay about in the garden. The particular atmosphere, or rather the international one, is worsening. I am generally apprehensive. Tuesday, 22nd of August, I opened the newspaper and read, emblazoned across the ever-sensational express, nothing much changed, uh, German-Russian pact. They have been coquetting severely with Germany, even as our negotiations proceeded. They are the foulest people on earth, and now it looks like a war and a possible partition of Poland. Nothing much changes with Russia, either. Uh, Thursday, 24th of August, the whole house expects war. I suppose it's like getting married the second time. It, it is impossible to work out the same excitement. Certainly London is calm, almost indifferent. Friday 25th of August, on, on affection at 5.30, and we drove to Kelvedon in the heat. Harold Balfour rang from the Air Ministry with news that Hitler had sent for Neville Henderson, who was to return to London to report the conversation. Wednesday, 30th of August, the long, the long answer from the German government came and was thought to be unsatisfactory by most of the cabinet who met to consider it. We are still urging Germany and Poland to negotiate, but the Germans seem determined to have their war. The household, Friday, 1st of September, the household returned to London. Alan and Harold came to lunch with Ola and me. We faced the facts. We are on the very verge of war as Poland was this morning invaded by German troops. Saturday, 2nd December, the door opened into the cabinet. Uh, that is Sam Hoare, MP. The door opened into the cabinet room. I saw Sam Hoare alone in a dinner jacket. The various chiefs of staff were wandering about in uniform and Corbyn, the steely grey, that's uh, Corbyn, the French uh, 
ambassador in London. The steely grey frog ambassador slunk into another room and was soon in conference with the PM. He was told our decision. We had already instructed Neville Helmson to ask for an interview at 9am to inform the German government that unless news came by 11am that they had no that had ordered the withdrawal of their forces from Poland, that we should be at war. 10, Sunday, 3rd of September, 10.57am. The PM is to broadcast at 11.15, and in a few moments a state of war will be declared. I went up with Victor Braun to the F Foreign Office wireless station and listened to the PM. He was dignified and moving, brief and sad. He was barely finished when the sirens announced an air raid. In the evening, I dined with Peter Loxley. Anyway, that last photo was of chips under the telephone. In the, you don't have to do that to me. Chips in, uh, in his um, London home. In the evening, I dined with Peter Loxley and Harold Balfour at the Savoy in semi darkness. The restaurant was almost empty and the streets completely black. In the night, there was another air raid alarm, but I did not wake until called by the butler. Then I joined the servants in the cellar where I found everyone good tempered and funny. The Duke of Kent sent me a message to asking me to go to his shelter next door, but I was too sleepy and declined. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? No questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is this is the um, second volume. There is a third volume coming out um, later, well, in September. I mean, the, the original diaries are published in 1962, um, and they were edited by um, a, Tor a conservative MP whose name escapes me. But anyway, the, the book was regarded as rather risque at the time, although there's really nothing. It's only 250 pages. Uh, the diaries that have been published now, I mean, every volume is a 1,000 pages. I haven't even gone through it all. And, you know, th these are the ones they thought would never be published. But uh, eventually, um, the son of Paul Channon, uh, Henry Ch who actually died quite recently, he's only in his early 50s, uh, he and his wife um, agreed to have them released and the um, Simon Heffer has edited them so there is another volume coming out uh, coming out later this year but it, in fact I mean really after the war uh, Chan's political career was virtually finished because he was an appeaser and church, you know, he was no friend of church So, uh, Duff Cooper, the other great diarist of the era. Yeah. Um, so, do they? Does, does that? I mean, obviously, you've read them. So, does, yeah. does, uh, does he get much of a mention? I'm just wondering. Yes, about um, I, I didn't include it. Um, I don't know why. I mean, there are. He, 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 and Duff Cooper. I mean, Diana Cooper was Duff Cooper's wife, and as you say, Duff Cooper uh, wrote his own diaries, which are mainly about his uh, romantic exploits. I have read his diary. They're not as interesting, I don't think, as Chapman's. Um, he was quite a licentious man, um, uh, but he was very, he was very pro, he was very pro, or anti-Germany, and very much with uh, Churchill and Eden in that regard. And so, although they were friends, they obviously didn't. He sa he says a lot of things that he calls. Um, Cooper, sort of Duff Cooper, sort of pumped up, bantam cock, and you know, lots of. I mean, he was never nasty, but obviously he didn't 
he felt he was on the wrong side of the aisle, which he wasn't. But, you know. And in fact, um, although I didn't include it, there are a, a lot of anti-Semitic references in the diaries, which was of the period. And, and Shannon, um, he wasn't pro-Hitler. He was just like a lot of um, right-wing people and the aristocracy in England. They were more worried about communism than they were about Germany. They, at that stage, obviously up until you know the start of the war, they weren't aware of the Germans' intentions or the concentration. That wasn't common knowledge. Uh, I don't think you know the anti-Semitism didn't bother them, but I, they obviously weren't aware of what 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 Hitler had in mind for the for the Jews. But to be fair to Chanlin, he did change his views once everything was known. But certainly before the war, he was very much... Um, couldn't see why we were going to war with Germany. I mean, he was right to the extent that, you know, we couldn't uphold our... You know, we didn't stop Germany invading Poland, but we had to, we had to draw a line somewhere. Um, this is not perhaps <coughs> germane to particularly gentleman's diaries, but I'm, I'm given to understand that we lambast Neville Chamberlain, but in reality, um, he, he did uh, set about, because in the 30s, the, British, the Royal Air Force was very antiquated, uh, the Royal Navy was very antiquated, yeah. very large dreadnoughts, but yeah. not particularly good, um, and he actually set about rebuilding and rearming Britain. So yeah. to some extent, Churchill stood on the shoulders of his uh, well, I, I, I think, Hitler, yet also I, I think, being cautious. I think you're right in terms of there's been a certain re a vis revisionist view of Chamberlain who was lambasted as being an appeaser. And you're right to say we weren't in a position to fight a war. And, 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 and uh, I don't think uh, Chamberlain was given enough credit for actually allowing time, for, certainly, for, and certainly for the British Air Force, to rebuild. Um, Build new planes, bombers, fighters. Um, I mean, the Spitfire comes because yeah, Chamberlain yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, absolutely yeah. again because Chambers, Chambers yeah, yeah, he doesn't get enough. He's getting credit for it now. If you, if, if people want to read books about it, but it's fair to say. But then on the other hand, both he and Halifax, who was the foreign secretary, both you know were misguided in. They thought they could. They thought they could handle Hitler. I mean, Hitler just thought they were a bunch of idiots. I mean, you know, he signed that piece of paper at Munich. He, you know, he was like signing a napkin. He didn't know what he, you know, he didn't mean anything to Hitler. They didn't care what he said. No, he didn't mean, you know, they had a discussion, but Hitler hadn't agreed anything. I think Chamberlain asked him to sign something. And Chamberlain came back brandishing it, and he came, uh, he was actually, uh, people don't remember it now, but he was actually on the balcony with King George VI and the Queen. And that he, he took the um, applaud it. I mean, both both King George VI and the Queen Mother, uh, I wouldn't say they were appeasers, but they certainly certainly supported Chamberlain and Halifax, and they certainly didn't want Churchill. They thought Churchill would take us to war, which he, well, obviously he did, but then, you know, we were... Well, Ch Ch Chamberlain took us into not, war. It's not as if Churchill had a great history as well. You no, know, no, 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 he didn't. He had a very patchy history, but he was... He was, spotty career there. he was right about the fact that you couldn't trust Hitler. You mm. couldn't do a deal with Hitler, whereas Chamberlain and Halifax would have, I'm virtually certain, would have done some agreement with Hitler, which would have been us signing away, well, I don't know, most of the empire and you know, probably the UK as well. I mean, yeah. who knows? Like France or something, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, yeah. So you're right. You're right. I mean, basically, what you're saying is right. I mean, Chamberlain bought time. There's no doubt about that, and, and he's got to be credited with that. But also, you've got to consider the fact that you know he, you know, I mean, he felt crushed by the fact that you know he couldn't avoid a war. Did everything, you know, I mean, I used to be a big fan of Churchill, but you know, Chamberlain tried everything yeah. to prevent that war in his eyes, you know, and, yeah. and he, by getting Hitler to sign that, you know, I've got no further territorial demands of Europe, that he was sort of proving, 
know, yeah, I mean, right, he, Hitler goes beyond that, well, then he's, he's then Hitler's proved. He, he's well, he was so, he was so desperate he's, that, he's, you know, he got Hitler to sign virtually a napkin, which, um, yeah. and said, I've got the signature of the German charm, and it was, you know. He also had very poor advice from the military, in terms of Chamberlain. Yeah, they, they, they convinced the government that there was a war, everyone would die in the first two weeks from gas bombing. Yeah. Like, the German airplanes would just oh, yeah. devastate yeah. Britain. Well, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that we we weren't prepared. You know, Chamberlain bought time, and you know, obviously, yeah. we wouldn't have. You know, we wouldn't be here now. I mean, it, we would have lost the Battle of Britain. Um, mm. He gave us time to build. You know, you, you've got you've got to praise him for that. But ultimately, so in those six months meant that basically hurricanes became the first line of aircraft. Yeah. In thirteen, Germans couldn't have done anything to anybody. No, we we. That's not what they thought. That's not, that's not what they Absolutely. Thought. I mean, there was all the military that Germany Before, before some space satellites. The, at the happen. time that Dominion is speaking as a Kiwi, I don't think the Aussies and the Canadians, and the, you know, we didn't really want to go for another war. We'd already had World War I. No, you know, and we, you know, And like most people, we didn't want that war. And, you know, it no. had to. It, it, it's almost, it, it had but, to. But as a Dominion, they along, were. You know. they, they would have been called up because they were. Yeah. yeah. But they had to take that into account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we 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 obviously we 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 couldn't have fought the war in uh, in in Burma in anywhere without colonial troops. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there was feedback, of course, I'd imagine, in the government from the colonies to uh, their their you know through ambassadors, etc., and and so forth, the regents and so forth, as to what was the tenor, shall we say? And, 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 and therefore, Chamberlain would have been in a very difficult position. And you know, well, I mean, the fact, the fact is, yes. yeah, but I mean, the fact, the fact, heels didn't, you know, you know, even in, 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 I mean, I, Poland, it took them a couple of days to actually sign up. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to put it bluntly, but the, at that time, the end, they were part of the British Empire, and they fight for the crown. So if we if, if Britain declares war, that's the whole of the empire. Everybody's in it. You can't, you can't opt out of it. Thank you for correcting Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that's correct. I could be. Right. Thank you. Why is that there? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those of you watching at home. Thank you very much for your other efforts. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>